Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, if you can go without a monitor temporarily so the audience listening online can hear and then we'll fix it before or we'll attempt to fix it before the council. We'll, we'll be good. Okay. 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 So new OGEC enforcement. As I mentioned now, they will have the authority to enforce all public meeting violations. How a public meeting violation would come to OGEC is that, let's say an organization has a public meeting. If someone thinks that the rules for public meetings were not followed within 30 days of that meeting, they have the opportunity to send something to, they would send it to the city or whatever organization in writing and to OGEC. We would have time to reply and respond. We could cure the decision by having a new meeting. We could rescind the decision. There's also a requirement where potentially you would have, the organization would have to admit that they did not follow the public meeting laws. And then there would be um, also potentially civil fines could be uh, assessed also by OGEC. The other part of the new enforcement is a new training requirement. And so now organizations that have more than a million dollar budget, the public officials now will need to do a training once per term provided by OGEC. It's sort of in the works still. It will be, my understanding is, I think there will be a remote option, but it'd be similar to a webinar, but it would be a public meeting training. I think this is a good way to get some consistency across the state for how public meetings are handled and then helps them with their enforcement if they're doing the training also. So more to come on that, but that would be a new training requirement for public officials once per term. So you'll see uh, more information about that, I think, as they roll it out. Um, before we go on to Tort Claims Act, any questions about public meetings or any other stuff? Okay. I think as we get more information about the OGEC training, that will get forwarded to you. I'm sure that will be blasted out lots of ways, but I'm picturing it kind of like your um, SEI filing that you do, the financial statement filing, that it'll just be another thing to add. Okay, so the Oregon Tort Claims Act, this is a set of statutes that allows people to file lawsuits against the city for torts. So it actually grows out of um, British common law, which was the idea that the king could do no wrong, right? So you're not going to sue the king because he's the king. You're not going to be able to sue him. <laughs> but that um, idea of sovereign immunity has changed over time as government has changed. And so now there are opportunities to sue the government for wrongs that the government does to you for these torts, which I'll talk about in a minute, but they're subject to certain limitations about notice and the amount of damages that you will get. And the Oregon Tort Claims Act applies to state claims, um, and it's not every way that the city can have liability, but it is a significant um, issue here for the city for the types of claims that a local government like us would deal with. Um, a tort is a real law school term, but it's a wrongful act or the infringement of a right. So an assault, a push, um, a um, infringement of a right could be um, like a due process right that you may have through the um, constitution, um, property damage, through a car accident, that's one that we deal with quite a bit. So those are the kinds of claims that you'll see um, officers and employees and agents who are acting in the scope of their job. So that includes councils, it includes volunteers, it includes employees. And it's when you're acting within the scope of your duties that you're covered under, um, that the city will indemnify and represent you. The, um, uh, let's see, acting within the scope of your duties has a specific definition and it talks about a, um, look here, so make sure I don't get it wrong. No willful or wanton neglect of duty, which I know sounds overly legalistic, but I do think it's important to remember that while people are acting with the scope of their job, they are covered under this. And this is where we, I also think it's important to think about 
you know, this is why it's important to do trainings like this. This is why it's important to have good contracts, employee expectations, you know, performance management, all those things let people know what the expectations are about what their work is. And then that limits liability or allows us to be covered under the Tort Claims Act. So something important. The last bullet here is really the part that where Jamie has the most interaction. And this is the idea that the city indemnifies and represents um, when we have a tort claim while somebody's acting within the scope of their employment. So what that means is, is we are members of city county insurance, which you know, that is the organization that represents most cities in Oregon and some counties. It's an insurance pool. So when we have a claim, you know, or the process is Jamie will notify CIS, they assign an adjuster, just like any other insurance claim. That person um, investigates, she will assist with gathering information for them. They may settle the claim. If a lawsuit is filed, they'll hire litigation counsel. So that would be a separate attorney who would handle that litigation moving forward. Lots of coordination on our part with those folks. Um, but that's generally the process for um, claims. That includes the city as an organization, and then also individuals if they're named in the lawsuit, which you'll often see in a caption, a lawsuit caption, it would be like city of Springfield, and then often high-level officials will be named as well. So that's part of the information about the Oregon Tort Claims Act. These are the limitations on the Tort Claims Act that are a little bit unusual. So there are some notice requirements. And I think this is the part where we talk a lot about uh, tort claim notice. You know, you'll hear that term and I think people are like, what is that? So that is a written notice to the local government that a claim may be coming. It needs to be specific enough so you know what the claim is. For um, wrongful death suits, the limitation is it must be notified within a year of the incident. For other claims, it's six months. You know, a tort claim notice is really an opportunity for an organization to figure out how do we remediate whatever, if there was an issue. Also, let's investigate, let's uh, investigate and keep information to see if there is a claim. But it is a requirement for Oregon T Tort Claims Act claims. The other issue with uh, the Oregon Tort Claims Act is that there are damage limits that are set by the state. Those are adjusted a year by CP every year by CPI. So um, those are the limitation on the damages someone could claim someone could get under these claims. Remember though, there are and not to be a real downer, there's lots of ways we can be liable to other people. So there are breaches of contract, workers' compensation, other um, areas where local governments like Springfield can deal with liability. This is a big one for us because really, you know, property damage, car damage, law enforcement claims is going to fall under a lot of this. Um, but it's not the only way that we can be liable. And then that connects back to our contracts and the insurance requirements in our contracts, trying to make sure we're adequately covered. So that's another area where Jamie does a lot of work and making sure that our requirements make sense. Sometimes we will adjust those depending on what they are, what the service is. You might see like a, you know, library performer's not going to need to have the same contract as other people, but um, that's usually on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, also, we'll often require other types of insurance on claim, on contracts, Cybersecurity is a big one now, really big issue right now. Um, and then you'll see things like professional liability insurance as well for professionals. Any questions on the Oregon Tort Claims Act or anything related? Okay, last slide. Uh, Packet has extra materials about ethics, public meetings, public records. It's reference material. There's uh, links in there for where you can look for information on um, these topics, it's just really meant to be a reference for you to use in the future. You can always contact my office and we can talk through these issues with you. Um, the, um, also, there's some background on the information we discussed tonight. Two more items, you'll see a link, an email from my office with a link to a webinar for uh, harassment and discrimination webinar training, be approximately an hour. It's provided by CIS, we've done it before. 
you should be able to follow those instructions. If you have problems, you can just con you'll con you can contact Linda from my office and she can walk you through it. Um, two other things I think you'll see from us um, for uh, city council training in the next few months would be political activity of public employees. It's getting to be election season. So city manager's office always sends an email to all employees reminding them of the limitations of political activities while they're at work. And I thought what I would do this year is forward that to you with some more information that's specific to elected officials, just so you can kind of see both sides of how that works from in terms of a liability. And then the last thing is there was a case um, at the Supreme Court about comments on social media websites or social media platforms and accounts of elected officials, how they handle those. And so once we get that decision, we will bring that to you. Um, and I think that's it. Last, I just wanted to say thank you. I know that um, I always appreciate this opportunity to get to talk to you all about these issues. And I think it's important that we do it on a regular basis. And then just also welcoming Jamie to the city. Um, I think she's gonna be able to bring a lot of experience and um, data and, and information that's gonna really help us understand risk better and where we have liabilities and where we don't and where we can maybe take advantage of opportunities or look at things a little bit differently. So I think we'll be good. Um, that's all I have, unless you have anything else. Anybody have questions? Steve? Yeah. The Lady that's with you, I did not write her name down, so I apologize. Oh, sure. It's Jamie. Jamie, thank yeah. you. Uh, do you have any additions or comments about what Mary Bridget said? No, I've uh, been in the claims world for about 38, 39 years and actually specializing in risk and contracting, insurance purchasing and all that since 2004 uh, for the city of Eugene for 18 years. So um I know just about all there is still about claims and contracting and insurance. So <laughs> I'm really excited to to be here. Gently learning. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, one set of questions I did have is, could you, uh, Mary Bridget, talk a little bit about serial meetings in the context of sometimes when we have big political, when we have big policy issues, we know that somebody's sort of going around and having coffee with mm -hmm. everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we approach that to avoid that sort of serial meaning? I think what I would be thinking about uh, with those types of meetings, so let's say someone's making the rounds, yep. so to speak, um, I'd be thinking about the topics of what they're talking about. I think it's, you know, and this is always your call, but it's always okay to be like, you know what, we're not going to talk about that. I'm happy to be here with you and talk about X, Y, and Z, but this decision's coming before us in two months and, you know, we're not going to go there. Um, I think I would avoid other follow-up conversation amongst yourselves, um, as particularly electronic conversation. You know, I coffee with so-and-so, he's going to call you about so-and-so, we're going to talk about so-and-so, like avoid, try and avoid that. Even emails or texts or any other communication that way. And then I think in those conversations, and I know this is hard, but, you know, to try and avoid really... Um, making clear what you think the council's position will be or what your position is if you still have more deliberation to do. Like this is all, you know, this could be a, I don't know if there's some way to kind of, you know, gracefully be like, well, that's something we'll talk about in our, you know, as when we all meet in our deliberations and thanks for the info. Um, and then you can always bring that information to the meeting too, um, I think is also another good way to handle it. So, but I know that though, I know that happens and you're, you know, it's not even coffee. Sometimes you just see somebody at Fred Meyer and they're, you know, wanting to talk about something. So um, I know that's how it goes for elected officials, but sometimes I think relying on that the body makes the decision and you can't speak for the body until you're in the public meeting is a real nice way to say, thanks for the info. I don't know if that helps. Oh, I, anytime we talk about it, it, it helps, right? Because yeah. it's a refresher on how to navigate those situations. Like one, one thing I've used before is like, don't, if you're having conversations with multiple people is to just say, don't share what I share yes. with you. Yeah. And don't share what, like say, Hey, so-and-so yeah. told me this, like, no, 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 no. you yeah. and I are just having a conversation here. I think the other thing to um, remember is you can talk to one another about how you approach your work on the council. You know what I mean? Oh, I answer emails this way, or I do this, or I like to try and do this. That's okay. That's not about items that are you're deliberating about. So it's sort of like talking with a colleague about, 
you know, how they do their work. That's totally fine to be like, hey, how do you approach these? You know, when someone asks you this kind of question, what do you do? Totally fine. It's good to kind of get other people's perspective and other elected officials, especially, you know, and the people on your own group are great people to talk to. So. All right. Any other okay. questions? All, All right. right. Well, thank you. I think we feel trained. Okay. Thank you so much. Good. You did. <laughs> Check the marks. <laughs> All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and adjourn us until seven, and then we will reconvene. I'm going to call the Springfield City Council regular session to order with a roll call. Mayor Van Gordon. Here. Councilor Weber. Here. Councilor Moe. Councilor Rodley. Here. Councilor Blackwell. Here. Councilor Doyle. Here. And Councilor Pichonary. Here. Thank you. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. As we be as we begin our meeting tonight. There are two designated times for public testimony this evening under public hearings and business from the audience. If you are attending in person, please complete the request to speak card located at the entrance of the council chambers and give to the city recorder. If you're joining us online with a tablet, smartphone or computer and wish to speak of either of those times, please raise your hand in Zoom. The order of public testimony is as follows. Anyone in person in the council chambers and then anyone who's raised their hand in Zoom. Neil, how many people are joining us online? Uh, we have four attendees online at this point. All right, thank you. First item. First item is the consent calendar. I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Neil, could you call a vote, please? Yes, Councilor Weber. Yes. Councilor Moe. Yes. Councilor Rodley. Yes. Councilor Blackwell. Yes. Councilor Doyle. Aye. And Councilor Pichonary. Yes, thank you. Motion passes, six yeses, zero noes. Next item, please. Uh, next item is public hearings. You have four public hearings this evening. Public hearing number one is request for Metro Plan Diagram Amendment and Zone Change for 4.99 acres of property located at the northeast corner of Game Farm Road and Maple Island Road. <clears throat> this is ordinance number one, ordinance amending the Eugene Springfield Metropolitan Area General Plan or the Metro Plan Diagram by redesignating approximately 4.99 acres of land from Campus Industrial CI to Commercial C, concurrently amending the Gateway Refinement Plan Diagram by redesignating the same 4.99 acres of land from Campus Industrial CI to Community Commercial CC, concurrently amending the Springfield Zoning Map by rezoning the same 4.99 acres of land from Campus Industrial CI to Medical Services MS, adopting a severability clause and providing an effective date. Andy Limbert is here for this item. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, this request for Metro Plan Amendment and Zone Change affects a portion of Peace Health property, uh, which is located in the North Gateway area of Springfield. Um, I've got a map up for, for context and hopefully be able to advance it. Um, most of the site is what I, staff would term a relic filbert orchard. Um, the area immediately to the east is the former Sony plant. Uh, which is now the Peace Health Laboratories, also known as the Peace Health Riverbend Annex. And this site um, is an area that is not developed, not previously developed within the campus industrial zoning. A little bit of context, the area um, to the east, as I mentioned, was the original Sony site. The area immediately to the west across Maple Island Road was previously Symantec. It has now been taken over, um, at least partially, by some Pacific Source uh, administrative offices. Another notable early, we'll call them early colonizer of the campus industrial area uh, was Royal Caribbean, and unfortunately also has departed the area. So a number of the large early developers and site occupiers um, in the campus industrial district uh, have left. There's been transition to new and increasingly healthcare related or tangentially related uh, industries. There is not provision for healthcare, uh, medical lab or medical uh, clinics, doctor's offices, hospitals, 
listed in the campus industrial district. So by necessity, the applicant has proposed to change the zoning on the site to medical services. That does provide a relatively narrow range of uses on the site, including hospitals, but it does require an underlying commercial designation. So that's the reason for the comprehensive plan amendment and zone change is to change the under underlying designation from campus industrial to commercial allowing for the zone change. Staff advises that this is the first of what might be multiple inquiries um, about healthcare related uses in the campus industrial district. The applicant has sought this site specific redesignation and rezoning as the most uh, expeditious way, the most efficient way that they saw for to move forward uh, with their plans currently. Um, there may be other uh, requests that council may face either through staff or uh, directly uh, for other adjustments to, to the district. So this site uh, adjoins the um, Pacific Source property to the, to the west. Um, immediately to the southeast, although not shown currently on these air photos, um, is the Esther assisted living facility. So um, a lot of the properties in this area have been developed um, with um, assisted living, healthcare, there's a memory care facility as well. So there's a, been an evolution in this area and in the immediate vicinity towards healthcare related and other, other related uses. So currently the site is on the Metro plan diagram at least is uh, part of the campus industrial zoning, which is kind of shown in very general layout on this map. The applicant is proposing to change the designation to commercial as noted in the pink dot there essentially on the map. Um, the zoning map would be changed from its current campus industrial zoning, which is also shown in the gateway refinement plan um, to commercial designation. And finally, uh, changing the zoning from, from its current campus industrial on the Springfield zoning map to uh, medical services. Staff is recommending extending the zoning boundaries along the perimeter so that there are not any residual campus industrial zone slivers along either Denman Ferry Road or Maple Island Road. So extending the southern boundary right to um, the southern edge of the public right of way and then using the midpoint of Maple Island Road as the western boundary so that if there are future changes to designation and zoning, um, these boundaries will align and there won't be any little any little gaps or, or uh, orphan pieces left behind. So that comprises the, applic the application request. The applicant has provided a conceptual development plan for rehabilitation hospital. Um, this is not the same as the Peace Health uh, at the Sacred Heart Medical Center at Riverbend. It has emergency services and trauma care, helicopter, you know, air, air ambulance, um, inbound ambulances, and that sort of thing. There were some expressions of concern you do have in your packet from some comments uh, from adjacent residents about noise and traffic. Um, I guess inevitably, as sites develop in this area, there's, it's not fully developed in this area of Springfield. There will be increases in traffic. Uh, however, this is not the type of hospital where there's going to be ambulances, lights, and siren uh, coming to drop off patients uh, at all hours of the night. So um, that should, I guess, mitigate concerns about, about noise, uh, specifically with ambulances and sirens. Um, again, this would be a land use action um, that would be further to council's uh, review this evening. Site plan review would be required, so be additional opportunities for adjacent residents, property owners to review the specific plans and then comment on those as well. So the request before you this evening is for the comprehensive plan amendment and zone change. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know that the applicant also has it as a uh, presentation this evening as well. Joe. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate your thought process and being able to do some seamless changes down the road if need be it's well thought out. A little concerned about creating an island. Uh, of that that only designation in that area just it, it seems contrary to what we have historically done um i'm not like opposed to it i'm just bringing that to your attention uh, and it's it, if i correctly understood you the residents there are going to be the elderly type um this would be like a short stay uh rehabilitation type of hospital so not a, not a residential type correct yeah okay. so okay. for physical therapy oh, okay. uh, for 
trauma, you know, traumatic brain injury, injury recovery, that sort of thing. So I think the, the applicant probably has a better um, explanation of how the hospital would be um, uh, staffed and the, in the type of patients that they'd be seeing, but it would be for people to be staying there multiple days, typically. So staff's would, understanding. Is there anticipated increase of code three ambulance responses to there? as far as something from surgery going sideways or are they well enough so to speak to where they're being rehabilitated and, and on the, the road to recovery as opposed to having some medical emergency um staff's understanding is that this would be transitional to actually being released back to you know your house essentially so it'd be a, a period of time when there isn't a requirement for um critical care or um, intensive care or anything like that so um, I guess no more than any other type of facility where their ambulance might respond. Um, it should not generate any elevated um, chance of ambulance response. Thank you very much. Just, I, I like it. I mean, as far as we need it, it seems like yeah. we need that. Thank you. Victoria. Thank you so much for the um, presentation. And I think um, that there are situations like this where we do, it sort of seems like it's an island, but I think that as a community, things change. And, you know, we we see an area and we think that it's going to be, you know, a campus industrial or, you know, um, different like that. And then we realize that the the needs of our community have changed. And, and now that we're seeing a more medical feel in that, I would almost like to see that expanded by the by the city to where we're start we start inviting that because it looks like that's something that's um that could be a, a nice positive thing to take the place of the stuff that we've lost if we start to see interest in that so um i'm, I'm definitely supportive absolutely thank you steve okay i was thinking the same thing uh incremental zoning you know a little patch here a little patch there adding to add later on and i know i'm not trying to screw up anybody's application by the way but <laughs> by saying is there some way we can add to it easily now without some problems in the, in the future so that's all i guess in theory but um you know technically staff and and the council typically looks for property owner support and endorsement um they may not be at the stage necessarily where they're prepared to make that type of commitment but it may be a path that is, you know, an initial path that Peace Health is um, pioneering, so to speak, for others to follow. Or there may be other changes that could uh, be done through like a code um, code amendments as well. So there's there's a couple options out there to counsel. All right. I don't see any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, I don't have any cards for this item. But I'm assuming you're with Peace Health. Yes. Okay. So when we're done, if you can fill out a card for AJ, that would be great. And say, state your. Your Honor, uh, City Council, my name is Mike Reeder. I'm an attorney uh, with my law firm, law, law Office of Mike Reeder in Eugene, 375 West 4th Avenue, Suite 205. I represent Peace Health in this application. And uh, I want to first thank uh, you for uh, hearing the this application in a public hearing tonight. The Planning Commission has already heard this they've had a they've had a public hearing the planning commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of this application um, staff has done a wonderful job in preparing this application for your uh, consideration this evening the staff report is very thorough in both the plan amendment application as well as the zone change application um, i'm here to answer questions that you may have but also uh, with me tonight is the applicant's transportation engineer, Kelly Sandow from Sandow Engineering. And uh, also with us tonight in person is Grady Lehman from Peace Health. He's the director of development for Peace Health, and he's here in the audience should you have any questions that I cannot answer. And then also uh, uh, Alicia Beamer from uh, Peace Health. She is the chief administrative officer 
She was in person at the Planning Commission hearing. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here in person tonight. Uh, I believe she is online. Should you have any questions of, uh, of her, um, she may be having trouble connecting. I'm not sure if you can tell if she's online. In any case, if you have any questions, she might be able to answer those as well. But tonight I'm here to present this application. Uh, the application for the plan amendment zone change in this particular location was selected because for a variety of reasons. One is it meets the city of Springfield's commercial industrial buildable lands policies for clustering of medical services. So we have the advantage of having this location. The property owner is also the applicant and the applicant owns the property, which of course, as we all know, is close to the Riverbend campus. So this is a great way to co-locate medical services. Um, in in uh, contrast to other jurisdictions, other states, the state of Oregon does not have uh, what we call spot zoning. So concerns about island uh, designations or island zoning is typically not a concern in the state of Oregon because we have comprehensive planning. And our application uh, that you have before you tonight goes through in detail how this application meets the criteria for approval for a plan amendment zone change. So as an applicant meets the criteria for approval, <clears throat> Uh, the concern about spot zoning is negated because there is a rational plan built into the plants. The plan has criteria for approval, and if, and if an applicant can meet those criteria for approval, there's no concern about uh, invalid uh, spot zoning. Uh, <clears throat> the proposal must be consistent with the statewide planning goals. We've demonstrated that we meet uh, the consistency with those uh, statewide planning goals, in particular, typically goal 12 is a concern. Goal 12 is the transportation goal. And uh, the traffic engineer's report that is in the record and in your packet shows that uh, the there will not be a significant effect on the transportation facilities. And that's an important provision. If As long as your application doesn't have a significant effect on transportation facilities, or if the applicant can propose mitigation measures for those significant effects, then the applicant meets the goal, goal 12 planning rule and the goal, and goal 12 requirements. Um, I guess I can quickly go through here. Much of this is in your pack. Well, all of this is in your packet. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, uh, there's an aerial uh, provided by the applicant showing uh, as staff indicated that we have a historic filbert orchard that is underutilized. Um, I think what might be important to understand is that the, the city has an inventory for land and we methodically went through to make sure that we weren't uh, doing something that was in violation of the city's long range planning. And we found that the, this site, this site needed about five acres and uh, other than the Riverbend campus itself, there were no other five acre properties that would fit this designation. So I believe that this is a, an efficient way to use underutilized land that's already developed. Um, and to do so, it, it releases, it reduces any pressure that uh, might be had on the urban growth boundary. There's no mandatory Metro plan policies that are applicable to this application. And there's, as this property is fully within a developed area, there are sufficient urban level services for this property. These are just some photos of the surrounding area that staff has already discussed. And with that, um, I will uh, close my comments and let the council ask any questions that you may have. I think we're good. Thank you so much for coming and presenting. Yeah. Oh, Steve. I can't help but look at that photograph and see that property to the north there. It would be a, I don't want to screw things up, by the way, a good addition to medical use in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards for this item. Neil, do we have anybody raise their hand wanting to speak to this item? Uh, no hands for this item. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. This is a first reading only, no action required. Next item, please.
The next item is public hearing number two. That's annexation of territory to the city of Springfield. Annex approximately 25.2 acres of industrial property located at 5230 High Banks Road, map 17-02-28-00, tax lot 402, and a portion of tax lot 405. Again, this is ordinance number two, an ordinance annexing certain territories, vacant parcels, address is 5230 High Banks Road and identified as assessor's map 17-02-28-00, tax lot 402 and a portion of tax lot 405 to the city of Springfield and Willamette Lane Park and Recreation District, adopting a severability clause and providing an effective date. And Andy Limbert is here for this item. Thank you. Um, this is the first of three consecutive annexation actions that staff is requesting of the council. Um, council may recall that the public hearings for all three were held open. Uh, two of the requests for annexation had outstanding issues uh, that needed to be addressed between staff and the applicant. And so continuing the public hearing allowed for introduction of any new information into the council packet. What you have in your packet this evening is the annexation agreement that was negotiated between city staff, specifically um, the city attorney's office and engineering staff and the applicants legal counsel. Um, I can report that this morning, we received the signed version from the applicant. It did make it into the council packet. It has been delivered for the city manager's signature. Uh, so there is agreement um, between the city and the applicant uh, for the annexation agreement. In this case, it was specifically related to the unusual location of this property relative to existing stormwater services within the city. Uh, they do not extend this far north along 52nd Street. And in the event that public drainage is required for this property at some point um, beyond what the applicant can provide on the property themselves, um, there would need to be some arrangements made for extension of public stormwater uh, to the site. Um, that was the outstanding issue that staff and the applicant discussed at some length, and there were provisions included in the annexation agreement for contingent, contingencies, excuse me, uh, for stormwater service. Uh, so that is the nature of the changes that were made. Um, it was the annexation agreement specifically. There were no further comments that were provided uh, by the public uh, during the time of the continued public hearing. So staff is recommending um, closure of the public hearing and then council action. All right, thank you. Um, I do have one card for this item, Sean Highland. Hello, thank you. I am uh, Sean Highland, reside at 2100 Hayden Bridge Road in Springfield. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, mostly just wanted to speak about fees, different fees. Um, just thank you for reacting to the annexation fee issue I brought up, I don't know, a year ago or whatever it was. You know, it was going to be $73,000 is now a little over $9,200, so much appreciated with that it does help and not just me i know it'll help other people to get more things happening here um uh, unfortunately my next step is i have to do a metro plan amendment now um and that fee is a very large fee it's a fifty two thousand dollar fee um i don't totally understand all the planning exactly but it's about the same amount of work as what we have to do on this annexation portion so i know that there's been a study done on the fees and um Last I was told is potentially July that the fees will be adjusted. So I'm basically just asking for something quicker. Maybe you guys do something temporary and then figure out a way to then, you know, true up when they're at you actually figure out what they are. But I don't want to be on hold with my project. Um, it's a pretty simple project. Just going to store some RVs, you know, needed in Springfield. There's not much out there. Um, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, I, like I said, appreciate the get the annexation through. And uh, like I said, the Metro plan is the next piece of the puzzle for me. I just you know, like you guys to look at those planning fees. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do I have any, any other cards for this item? Neil, is there anybody online raising their hand? No hands for this item. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number two. Second. Neil, could you call the roll, please? 
Yes, Councilor Weber. Yes. Councilor Mo. Yes. Councilor Rodley. Yes. Councilor Blackwell. Yes. Councilor Doyle. Aye. And Councilor Pichonary. Yes, thank you. Motion passes, six yeses, zero noes. Next item, please. Next item is your third public hearing. This is annexation of territory to the city of Springfield. Annex approximately 4.42 acres of residential property located at 95466th Street. That's map 17-02-27-00, tax lot 2002. This is ordinance number three, an ordinance annexing certain territories, yeah. vacant parcel addressed as 95466 Street and identified as assessor's map 17 02 27 00, tax slot 2002 to the city of Springfield and Willamaline Park and Recreation District, withdrawing the same territory from the McKenzie Fire and Rescue District, adopting a severability clause, and providing an effective date. And Andy Limbert is here for this item. Thank you. Uh, this is the second um, annexation request that was um, provided uh, continuance by the city council. Uh, again, it was due to an outstanding issue that needed to be resolved in this case between city staff and Springfield Utility Board. Um, at issue was the provision of sanitary sewer service to this property. There is available uh, residential grade sanitary sewer service. The planned facility on the site would discharge, potentially discharge, uh, far more than what was anticipated as far as the sanitary sewer discharge into the residential uh, sized sewer pipe. Um, and so Springfield Utility Board uh, looked at a number of um, options and scenarios for dealing with that quantity of would be process water essentially for a for a water treatment plant, uh, but there's a large volume of water that contains um, trace um, organics and chemicals that are used in the in the water filtration process. So they need to be discharged into the sanitary sewer system, and at present there is not the capacity um, at the property line uh, for that type of um, discharge. Uh, so the Provisions in the annexation agreement that's included in your packet look at uh, the necessity for Springfield Utility Board to look at capacity downstream and, if necessary, build in additional capacity to their site uh, for discharge of the water in the future when the treatment plant develops. So that is the request before you this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. There were no additional um, public comments made um, during the continued public hearing. Okay, um, so I don't have any cards for this item. The public hearing is still open. Is there anybody online that wants to speak to this item? I see no hands for this item. Just one second. All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Victoria. I, I'm just trying to understand. So you're talking about putting stormwater in the sewer? Uh, in, a, would, in, the, in the wastewater sewer, you it would be it? it would be water used in the um, production of treat, of drinking water. Um, so there would be water that's used um, in the in the process of of introdu introducing potable water from the well fields that are nearby into the Springfield drinking water system. But there is um, residual water that would need to be discharged into the sewer system because it's not clean for um, stormwater discharge. Hmm. OK, thank you, Joe. So I'd be interested to see um, where MWMC stands in regards to its capacity and how it may affect its uh, NEPA permit or if there's going to be an effect there. I don't know what kind of materials may be in that water, but I would I would certainly like to hear what MWMC, where their position is on this and if MWMC itself can handle that type of, of increase. So my understanding after, I guess, informally discussing it with the MWMC general manager, um, their concern is not um, about accom accommodating that amount of, of flow. Um, there may need to be some upgrades to pump stations along the way or uh, additional pipe sizing to reach the site, um, but they are able to handle it um, at the plant. Um, so it's the transfer as as... I understand that this transfer point is near the Aspen Street boat state boat launch, um, where it becomes MWMC. And so um, getting it to that point, um, 
city staff and sub want to ensure that there's capacity to reach that point. And beyond that point, with the pump systems that are in place, um, they can accommodate um, any flow that would be generated by this facility. Okay. Well, I'm sure there'll be more conversations down the road in regards to Correct. that because of that. And again, there were uh, they did provide a number of scenarios and they were unable to, to finalize a specific um, quantity because they're still in the design phase. So when the application comes in and there's more details known, that's when they need to, to satisfy um, the sanitary sewer capacity um, criteria that staff will be looking at. And MWNC would be involved at that point as well because they'll be narrowing the sideboards on um, the exact quantity or volume of, of flows and the timing of those flows as well. Right. And, and you haven't heard anything negative back in regards to the potential content? Correct. Yeah, okay. it's 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 not it is something that could, I guess, in theory, be treated um, through on site uh, infiltration. But just the site is not large enough for that. Oh, okay. um, and so that's it, it's would just be extra, you know, volume in the sewage system, but not not um, hazardous in any way. Yeah, I'd be interested to see how we follow that track that. Thank you. Right. All right. Any other questions, Steve? I do. Uh, I sort of look at it as the water comes in, and the bad stuff's filtered out, and and the good good stuff goes on. And I guess the amount we're talking about is the amount that's filtered out. And you mentioned infiltration as a possibility. That's very interesting. But I think the volume that goes into the sewer system is the other question. So. Yeah, that's correct. You're on. Like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number three. Second. Neil, can you call the vote, please? Yes. Councillor Weber. Yes. Councillor Moe. Yes. Councillor Rodley. Yes. Councillor Blackwell. Yes. Councillor Doyle. Aye. And Councillor Pichonary. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes six yeses, zero noes. Next item, please. Next item is your fourth public hearing. It's an annexation of territory to the city of Springfield. Annex approximately. 0 0.86 acres of residential property located at 1010 Kinsley Avenue, map 18 02 06 24, tax lot 3800, and concurrently annex an abutting 45 foot wide by approximately 213 foot long segment of Kinsley Avenue public right of way. Again, this is ordinance number four, an ordinance annexing certain territories, residential parcel addressed as 1010 Kinsley Avenue and identified as assessor's map 18-02-06-24, tax lot 3800 and abutting segment of Kinsley Avenue public right-of-way to the city of Springfield, withdrawing the same territory from the Willa Kenzie Rural Fire Protection District, adopting a severability clause and providing an effective date. And Andy Limbird returns once again for this item. Thanks for your patience this evening. Um, this annexation request was actually, it was um, continued along with the other two requests. In this case, uh, staff advises that the annexation agreement was previously signed by the applicant. Um, they were seeking a plumbing permit to connect the existing house to sanitary sewer, which exists now that the Mountain Vale subdivision was constructed. Uh, so this is essentially um, more or less a formality of concluding the public hearing. There was no additional input uh, or need to resolve any outstanding issues uh, it during the time of the continued public hearing, uh, nor were there any um, additional public comments received. So um, this is before you for, I, I guess, decision time right now. All right. The public hearing is still open. I don't have any cards for this item. Do we have anybody online raising their hand to speak? No hands online for this item. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'd like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number four. Second. Neil, could you call the vote, please? Yes. Councillor Weber. Yes. Councillor Moe. Yes. Councillor Rodley. Yes. Councillor Blackwell. Yes. Councillor Doyle. Aye. And Councillor Pichonary. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Six yeses, zero noes. Next item, please. Next item is business from the audience. All right. We've got quite a few folks in the, uh, in the audience that want to speak, so I will call you guys up. The first one is Dustin McCluskey. Uh, could you state your name for the record and you have three minutes to speak? Hang on, Dustin. We're, there you go. Good evening, Dustin McCluskey. I'm here as a resident and board member of the Mountain Gate Lot Owners Association. I'm here to bring your awareness to an issue that we've been trying to solve 
through engagement with the city and Springfield Utility Board for the past year. Jessica Drive is a short, unoccupied dead-end street in Thurston at the top of 66th place. The second page of your handout has a good overhead shot of it. It is shielded from view and is used for drug use, illegal dumping, partying, and a staging area for vehicles that race dangerously down the hill. In 2022, and you can see on that overhead shot, the homes in, in various stages of construction, that 66th court is the, the cul-de-sac there, and then 66th place coming up. Uh, homes were built within hundreds of feet of Jessica Drive, and then throughout 22 and 23, this has been a major safety and quality of life detriment for members of our community. We've engaged with SUB and the City of Springfield for the past year, and everyone we've engaged with agrees um, that this is an important issue and to fast track the creation of the gate uh, below Jessica Drive. SUB had originally submitted a permit packet to create a gate in September 21, anticipating these issues. It was initially approved, but was later denied. Um, in May of 23, the city expressed the city funds would not be used to create the gate. After much discussion, SUB agreed to pay for the engineering and construction of the gate and met with our organization to select the location. SUB was told that a right of use agreement would be necessary to construct the gate, so the city would be able to have the gate removed if uh, more development happened at a later date. Uh, this summer, engineered drawings were submitted. Uh, in September, it was reviewed uh, by the city attorney, and instead it, uh, it was determined that an IGA was needed instead of an ROU, um, which kind of you know delayed the process and moved into a new phase. Uh, about a month ago, SUB received the IGA proposed by the city, and after reviewing it, I believe on December 22nd, they uh, withdrew their intention to enter into an IGA with the city or build the gate. Um, and that's really what got us to come to you guys. We kind of thought we were on a glide path to the finish line, and then, and then that disruption occurred. Um, so this gate is urgently needed to keep our neighborhood clean and safe, and we're asking uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and, and you, council members, um, exercise your leadership to help this gate become a reality and push it through the finish line. Uh, I've emailed the timeline of events and other supporting documents. Please reach out if additional information is needed. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Gary Hunt. And then after that's going to be Bob Anderson. Uh, I'm Gary Hunt. Uh, I'm also the president of the Mountain Gate uh, Lot Owners Association. But more importantly, I'm a resident of the Mountain Gate community that lives very close to where most of these things are occurring. I've spent um, on several occasions time going up and chasing uh, persons from the area that were uh, partying up there. Um, I found uh, homeless persons that were living up there, chased them away, uh, and tried to help out my neighbors uh, by telling them to never go up there alone like I had, but rather to give me a call and try to join in. I'm very concerned that you know these confrontations, I've lived up there now two years, I just moved here from the state of Washington, and uh, it, it has definitely become more of a problem uh, than it has been when I first uh, came down here and started construction of our home. So I am concerned that uh, there's a potential for something more serious to occur. Uh, the dumping of garbage is obviously, it's raw garbage. Uh, and uh, we don't want to develop you know, a pest problem um, by having it up there. The city uh, and uh, the police department have been very helpful to us. They've always responded in a kind way and cleaned up the area, although we've taken it on ourselves on a couple of occasions to clean the area as well. So I hope you'll uh, use your positions and your uh, abilities to help us get this accomplished. It has been a considerable length of time. I don't know that the expense is huge, uh, but uh, we would certainly appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Anderson. Good evening. I'm, I'm Bob Anderson. I live on uh, six, South 66 Court, which is right uh, in the same area where the gate's going to be. And it's, it's in within visual distance of my front uh, porch. But uh, a lot has been said about, you know, trash and um, 
drug use. Uh, when people think of drug use, they think of things like this. Well, I'd like to refocus things. My wife and I went up there yesterday afternoon. All right. If there's not props allowed. Oh, well. So, okay. You can there, go. There. To, thank you, though. Let me just say then that there are, are not just that canister, there were two canisters of that size plus an additional canister. So we're dealing here with hardcore drug use. And I'd like you to think of people high on that stuff driving down through the community because there's only three exits out of that whole area. There's uh, South 67th going down to Maine. There's going over to Forest Ridge to Mountain Gate, which goes to Maine on the right or to Bob Straub on the left. That means the people high on that stuff are driving their cars down through the community and virtually everybody in that whole community drives those streets, walks those streets, walks their dogs. Um, so everybody in the community, not just us at the very top. I would hope that uh, when you consider this, you focus in on that as an important consideration and work with us to uh, begin to solve the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike Hoskin. Hi, Mike Hoskin. We live on 66th Court. Mayor, distinguished members of the council, thank you for your time. We moved in March of 2022 to the Springfield area in Mountain Gate. Love it very much. It, it is a little piece of paradise. We have great views up there, super nice neighbors, all of many of whom came up here. My back door is about 100 feet from the drug location. The only person closer is Rick, who's going to speak to after me. We moved in March. The first nice day was first, second week in April of 2022. On my porch having coffee, the two cars out front before Bob and Patty's house was built overlooked the valley. Beautiful view. I don't know what the kids were doing in the car. I don't really care because they didn't bother me. I didn't bother them. Sun came up. They drove off. No problem. Next day and several days after that, kids in cars doing what kids do. Again, quite honestly, I don't have an issue. They're smoking pot, make whatever they're doing is they're not bothering us. They're fine. What happened, though, as the development happened and more houses were built and the fine folks in, in the room here moved in, the crowd moved around the corner up to Jessica Drive where it's more secluded. The views aren't quite as good, but it's more seclusion. And with that, brought different types of activity, which Bob did mention. I didn't care, again, whatever they were doing, making out, smoking pot, fine. But my wife and I, we walked four to six times a week. Uh, we were retired, thought this would be our retirement home. And we found, again, there's no props allowed, but drug paraphernalia, a, a mattress. Someone dumped a mattress up there called the city council. You guys have been great. You do a great job, by the way, because this is a great, great town. We love it here. Um, and the police come out during the day. I'm not sure why the patrol came out during the day because nothing happens until after dark. But they tried to do their part and the trash crew cleaned, it, cleaned things up. But multiple times over the next several weeks and about six to seven times, we've noticed similar, let's call it paraphernalia drug related, but again, trash and, and mattresses and clothes, and it, you guys can figure out what's what's there. We asked for a barrier. We're told by our HOA leadership, which is led by Dustin and Gary, that amazingly sub agreed to pay for the barrier. It's just a matter of paperwork, which is, I know can be necessary, but frustrating for us. Now we hear that that's on hold and there may be some problems with getting that approved. So what I do is I'm here to respectfully request you guys to please give it some thought and think about what would you do? We've got four grandkids who are of three of the four are of bike riding age. One of whom is of hiking age. There's no way that we sit when they're going to tell us, Hey, we'll be out front with our bikes and thinking they're going to drive up that way and see what they're going to see or encounter who they're going to encounter. What would you guys do if you lived in that neighborhood? That's all I'm asking you to consider. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Julie Wirtz. Okay, Rick.
My name is Rick Wirtz, and I thank you all for being here tonight and hearing us out. My wife and I moved over to 993 South 66 Court a couple, almost a couple of years ago. We loved our home, our home up on Moon Mountain, and we found the exact same home over on 66th Court. And we moved there because we wanted out of Eugene for exactly the same problems. Twice on Moon Mountain, we had police show up at our front door and say, do not come outside. We are searching for somebody. And they had dr drones flying overhead. And we said, that's it. We've had it. And Julie said, Rick, I'm moving out of here with or without you. So we bought this home up on 66th Court. And we weren't there very long. And then the party and started and all the activities. And it starts at 11 o'clock at night and it goes till 2 a.m. And a car will drive up and then other cars will go up, get their product and they leave. And we started calling it the drugstore. And shortly thereafter, we had no firearms. We have many firearms in the house now and every single one of them are loaded. And I don't like living like that. I shouldn't have to have a loaded shotgun sitting in my house, but that's the way we feel about it. We're at the point now in January, it'll be, well, this month, it'll be two years. And we're looking at selling and moving because we've had it. We've had, we had it in Eugene and the same thing's happening again. I just ask that somebody do something, large or small, just, Something's done. We originally asked for uh, concrete barricades to put up on Jessica to stop the people from going up there. And then it evolved into a gate. That's fine, probably better. But now I understand that may not be taking place. We just want to know that somebody is trying and somebody is offering up some, some kind of solution to correct the problem up there. Sending the Springfield Police Department up there during the day isn't doing it. Maybe at night it would make a difference. It's a lot more complex than I understand. I'm just asking that you guys really take it to heart because we're all really stressing out up there. And it's creepy when you're trying to sleep and you hear cars coming and going and music and partying and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's tough. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. David Candle. Thank you. I'll be I'll be brief. I live at um the corner of South 67th and South um 66th. I was the first one to move into that area of town. Um and all of what they're saying is totally true, is kind of what's been happening there. Um, I picked up drug needles there before, hauled out garbage. Um, like they said, the, uh, the police have been up there a few times. Um, like Gary was saying, um, he doesn't recommend people to go up there by themselves. He's specifically talking about me. I've been up there several times, um, called non-emergency, uh, a few times. Other people have to, I called 911 once when, um, somebody threatened to kill me. Um, they kind of chased me through the neighborhood and I called 911. So it's kind of not a safe situation. Um, originally, there was a barrier up in that area and it was in front of my house. And um, I was I was glad it was there. And then I was kind of glad when it when it left. But that was different where the location where the barrier needs to go now kind of blocks off that area that's kind of hidden back in back in behind there. Um my understanding is all the property that's past where that barrier would be is all owned by uh, city of uh, Springfield and or sub. Um, so um, I've heard that maybe there's some um, um, concerns that there could be um, litigation from putting the barrier there, um, but there could also be some for not putting the barrier there. Um, I live a little bit further from where the South 66 court is where most of the people were speaking. Uh, but even all the way down where I'm at, I've seen it. Um, the consequences of that, there are a lot of people that walk up there. Um, 
and uh, those numbers have decreased. I like the people that walk up there most of the time. Um, and when they see that messy up there, they start not walking up there and it really decreases the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards. Neil, do we have anybody raising their hand uh, online? Mayor, no hands. Okay. Um, well, thank you for coming and talking about this. I can see it is a lot. So um, I really am sorry your neighborhood's going through this. It is a lot. And we're going to ask some questions here. So I don't know who can give us an update about where this, about this Jessica Court issue. Yeah, we probably have a few people in the room that can give an update. But I, I do want to say, and I've said many times, the members of the homeowners up there and that HOA are very fortunate. They have an engaged homeowners association. I think we've worked very well on several issues that have included SPD and traffic and uh, CMO and the city attorney's office. It's just this one final piece that we're trying to uh, complete. And um, I can either pass it over to Jeff Pascal or Christina um, to give an update. And Christine, would you mind going first? And Sure, I can give an update on the intergovernmental agreement. Okay. Um, the intergovernmental agreement was proposed um, as a better alternative to a right of way use agreement because the structure of an intergovernmental agreement is to recognize that other public bodies can take on the role and duties and privileges of the city, which are generally broader than those that the general public can. A right of way use agreement is a formal permitting system that allows largely private entities to use the public right-of-way for a non-right-of-way purpose. An access gate is not a non-right-of-way purpose, and so it felt more appropriate to use an intergovernmental agreement. Um, from my perspective, the requirements placed on sub under an intergovernmental agreement are less um, onerous than in, under a right-of-way use agreement, which includes a lot of language around sub's obligations to, you know, remove or replace barriers um, at the whim of the city that is important to us when we're working with private uses of the right-of-way that are not for right-of-way purposes. The um, uh, sub's concern was apparently around the indemnification requirements, which is a standard provision in both the right-of-way use agreement and the intergovernmental agreement and any other contract that the city enters into that says that if there's litigation against the city because of this activity, the person responsible for the activity pays for the cost of those damages or that litigation. So if subs are erecting and maintaining a gate and someone were to run into the gate and be injured, then sub would be um, responsible for that, potentially any damages, if there were any, rather than the city. That's a standard clause. Um, so that's my only understanding um, of what the issue was with that IGA. Um, we weren't invited to negotiate. We were just communicated that sub was no longer interested. And that's and that's where it has left with the city attorney. Oh, okay. So Jeff Pascal, you want to like, so Christina, your understanding is we're good. It's in sub, like it's in sub sub score, right? Correct. Um, from our perspective, we proposed a, a pretty typical intergovernmental agreement for this that is similar to other intergovernmental agreements that we enter into with sub for other somewhat similar contexts. Yeah, so I don't have a lot uh, anymore. I've been in communication with Sub, um, kind of got that just a real general. They weren't pleased or weren't um, interested in some of the liabilities that that came with the IGA. Um, we're still talking to them. Um, right now, as I understand it, they're just pulling back from the gate altogether. That one of the statements is they've fenced all of their properties. All of the um, other lots up there are owned by Sub. Um, so... We've talked about a few other solutions as well, but that that's pretty much where we're at right now. All right. I don't know, Jeff, I know you're back there someplace. Do you, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but are but we're gonna <laughs> well do we what's the best thing for you? Should we just point them your direction or do you just not want to talk about it here? I'll just say I appreciate the Okay. Yeah. Jeff happened to walk in, so I apologize again yeah. for kind of putting you I on the spot. No, it's okay. I wasn't expecting to speak. So I want to recognize, appreciate the work uh, by uh, the city staff and council and uh, the concerns of the HOA. Our intent initially was to help construct the gate that was 
putting money towards the construction of the gate as part of our uh, part of that solution. So out of all the time uh, change, kind of where we thought we were going to start and where we ended up, but happy to re-engage in those conversations with the city and see if we can continue forward with the solution. But we've consistently said we're happy to pay for a gate. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. That was my alarm saying we ran, ran out of time for public testimony. So, okay. So Nancy, what's the best, like, it sounds like we just got to call some and get this thing sorted. I think that's uh, accurate. Uh, it, from the standpoint of the city, I think we're just trying to uh, find a path that works for both, both organizations. I, I want to apologize to the uh, Mountain Gate neighborhood. Uh, coincidentally, I almost was in your neighborhood when I became city manager here. It was in our short list, but my husband said, I do not want to walk our dog up and down all those hills. So we did not end there. So I do, I'm familiar with your neighborhood. I, it's very beautiful. Um, and we appreciate um, you coming tonight and, and expressing how this is impacting you. Um, I've already, I'm going to have some conversations with Chief Shearer about this as well. Uh, see if there's something uh, we can do. Um, I need to look at our staffing levels, but um, with re with respect to the uh, a legal instrument, I think you know we can. I think we can find a path forward. I'm com I'm confident in our city attorney's office to do that. All right, Joe, and then we'll go to Victoria. Hello, uh, excuse me. Thank you all for coming forward. I appreciate it. That too is my neighborhood, and my ward, and I have a significant in interest in what you have to say. That I've watched the chief very closely. In fact, when you were speaking, he was writing notes. And I can almost guarantee you I'd walk over there and he'd have the notes on what hours of interest should should the yeah. officers be there. Am I correct? And uh, so he, he is he is an amazing leader for our department, and I'm confident that that part will change. Uh, Jeff is sitting here. He's always had a good heart and trying to get to the right place wherever it is. And all of you are aware that obviously the government has got a different clock than what we all have. But. I think everybody here saw heard very clearly. I know I have because it's my neighborhood, and I know exactly what the activity is over there, and I've seen it, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to watch this real closely myself, and I think I'm confident. Not I think I, I, there will be a solution, and uh, we're just going to pound our way through it. Okay, with all the help I can do, I'll, I'll do it. Victoria, thank you, and I too am very familiar with the area. My my ward board. Um, butts right up next to it. And I walk those hills with my dogs because <laughs> I like to do it. Um, but I just want to mention that Springfield Utility Board's meeting is on the uh, second Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. at their office. So I just wanted to mention that. Beth? Uh, are these? Oh, Beth. oh sorry. Sorry. You said that. <laughs> you go. You go. You go. Um, I'm very familiar with that neighborhood as well. I used to live in it. It's a beautiful neighborhood and um, sounds like you have a great community since a lot of you showed up tonight. And I appreciate hearing from, from you all. Um, I have a question, I guess, um, can't barriers or the concrete barriers be a temporary maybe solution until this gets resolved or is that not something that can happen? I, I think a permanent concrete barrier would not be the appropriate Correct. because sub still needs access to their okay. property and the facilities. And so that's why I think we were looking at more of a gate that, okay. and also for emergency services, if there's any reason to get back there. Oh, okay. So I think, I didn't yeah. know if there was something that could block the, <laughs> block it off temporarily while things are. Yeah, no, as, as Neil said, we've, we've worked on, you know, the policing and worked on a lot of different trying to um, help the situation. It's been an issue um, I, the reason there was a gate there originally was the developer was struggling to sell the lots at a time they needed water and finally had that. And so the city put a gate in because of uh, all the four wheeling that was going on up there and destroying the public infrastructure and trying to work through the developer. And then that gate came down because these lots of these um, homeowners now live in were finally sold and built on. And so now we're just kind of talking about a handful of lots that are left up there that sub per purchased and sub owns. Thank you. Steve. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure exactly how everything is oriented here, but are those reservoirs publicly accessible? They're not. No. You can't get to them now. 
It's fenced off. Yeah, subs well, fenced. If you well, go up there, right, Jeff? Sub, you, yeah, subs fenced all of their property um, when we were kind of going through. And so to go back, the, the original approval when they approved the gate, it was kind of a it was a miscommunication on our internal at the staff that that should have never gone through on that approval because they just came in and asked for an encroachment permit to put a gate in the right of way. It kind of got approved at the counter and it was like, well, no, that's not the right tool. And so then we have been going back and forth with sub for quite a while. And then they chose to just fence all of their property. I'm, I'm not I'm not done. OK. Um, it appears to me that whatever wherever that gate is on the road, it, it's quietly accessible. And I would think that some would want to protect their reservoirs by putting barriers up further out towards the street would disenable people to get in there. That's that's all I could say. So I could just take care of it. Okay. Anybody else want to make a comment? Go. Cool. Sorry, just one quick one. You you notice the reaction from Jeff. When Councillor Doyle mentioned when the meetings are for sub, he was okay. He was saying, "Yeah, bring it." And so you've got our ears, and and we don't have a play in it, so to speak. So go to their board, their elected officials. They will listen to you. They got to listen to you. So I would highly recommend you go straight to his board, so his board can say, "Jeff, make it happen." And now he's can do whatever he needs to do. Right? <laughs> yeah. So let's do let's do a, a couple of things. Um, if Nancy, if somebody can let us know, maybe by the end of the week, I know you guys are still working on some things, um, but I'm I see a lot of interest up here. And if you could just jot us an email, that would be that would be fantastic. Sure, no problem. Um, this is important to us as well. And I again, I want to apologize for the length of time for this issue. Um, it's inexcusable, and I I do want to give you my apologies. <laughs> Um, and I think you've heard for the residents, I think we've all been pretty consistent. It would be helpful um, to for you guys to go to the sub board too, right? They're, they're our peer group, right? Like we all got to work on this better together. But hearing the same message, I mean, most of us didn't know anything about it until we got the first set of emails last week. We, we, no, we don't take questions here. But if you, if, you, if you hang out for a couple of minutes until we wrap up the meeting, you can catch us in the hallway. All right. Any other council response before we get to the next item? All right. Next item, please. The next item is business from the city council. Item number one is committee appointments and mayor, this is your item. All right. Um, I'm required to bring the annual committee appointments. They are in the packet. Um, I did see one typo. I left out that I was, Joe was going to be the liaison to sub. So I will get that added to the, uh, added to the list unless if you guys don't have any questions i don't think we have to do anything i just have to show it to them I'm so used to everybody being on one side all right next item please uh next item is business from the city manager item number one land acquisition purchase and sale agreement katie carroll and uh aaron fifield well katie carroll is here for this item All right. Um, good evening, Katie Carroll. I'm the city's housing analyst I'm here with a land acquisition item tonight. So um, as part of the city's housing strategy, which was first developed in 2017, councils directed staff to acquire land for housing targeting low income households. The city has funding through an intergovernmental agreement with Lane County to buy land for this purpose. Um, and those are Federal American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA dollars that were awarded to the county by the state and then subsequently um, the IGA with the city. Since February of 2023, the city has been contracted with a broker to assist with the process of searching for land and negotiating purchase of land for development of housing targeting low income households. So tonight, um, the action requested is to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a purchase and sale agreement for 1.1 acres of real property addressed 1566 Main Street, map and tax lot 17336310472 um, for the appraised value of $540,000. And there is a draft purchase and sale agreement attached um, and city attorney's office has highlighted some of the terms that um, may be part of 
what gets filled in. Any questions? You're up. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute the purchase and sale agreement for 1.1 acres of real property addressed 1566 Main Street as directed by us. Second. Neil, could you call the vote, please? Yes. Councilor Weber. Yes. Councilor Moe. Yes. Councilor Rodley. Yes. Councilor Blackwell. Yes. Councilor Doyle. Aye. And Councilor Pichinari. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Six yeses, zero noes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Any other bit? Any other business from the city manager? Just one quick item. I just wanted to uh, let the council know that this week city staff will be engaged uh, in a de-escalation and escalation prevention training. Um, I want to recognize Chief Shear and um, the uh, staff over at our Springfield Police Department that will be assisting in this training. You know, we have a very uh, complicated issues um, in our community and people experiencing various levels of crisis. And I think it's important that our staff get uh, a set of tools that they can use to help uh, people that are in crisis. And I think it's actually a, a helpful tool to have. Perhaps we should have done it before the holidays, but all that aside, I'm happy that we will be providing this training. Thank you. Any business from the city attorney? Uh, no additional business. Thank you. That is a wrap. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.